Welcome to EDLD 5313, Creating Significant Learning Environments. I'm Dr. Dwayne Harapnik, and I'm the lead instructor for this uh, course. I'm excited to be able to share with you my approach to creating significant learning environments, uh, which will help you create your own significant learning environments that will help your learners make the meaningful connections that are so, so important uh, to deeper learning. I'll begin by sharing a personal story that has really impacted my thinking and my actions towards learning and learning environments. A few years ago, uh, at a visit to the Whistler Air Dome, commonly referred to as the foam pit, uh, it reaffirmed my belief in the importance and power of learning environments and has caused me to uh, take a more significant stand on the role that the environment and circumstances play in learning. Consider the following. My boys, Levi and Caleb, decided that they needed to add backflips, tailspins, and a host of other tricks to their skill set, and they knew a visit to the foam pit would give them the safest and most pain-free way of mastering these stunts. For those who aren't familiar with downhill mountain biking, racing, dirt jumping, slope style, and other extreme uh, sports, uh, biking sports, there is one unfortunate reality that a rider constantly faces. It's not a matter of if one will get hurt, but when and how badly will the rider be injured. So when a rider can work on dangerous stunts like backflips, front flips, tail whips, x overs, and so on and so forth, and potentially eliminate or lessen the chance of getting hurt, they'll jump at the chance. <laughs> Pardon my pun. Uh, you also need to understand how the air dome works. Outside of two short four to five day bike camps, there's no formal instructors, no formal instruction. Even in the bike camps, the instruction that happens uh, in the aerodrome is less formal and really should be viewed as informal learning, peer-based instruction, or, or really just coaching. In this environment, more experienced riders readily offer advice and direction and guidance while reviewing video or the actual stunts. Most riders will comment and encourage and cheer others riders on. Success is shared by the whole group through cheers and other accolades, high fives when the rider finally makes a stunt. And failure is also shared by the group as all riders have grown with the peers who have blown a stunt and are suffering the consequences. Peer instruction and support happens on its own with no formal process. The social dynamic is a very significant part of the learning environment. Unfortunately, videos and pictures do not really full, fully reveal the scale and intensity of the stunts and the space itself. The main starting point for the foam pit is a very narrow platform 25 feet above the ground, and the ramp that riders hit goes from flat to completely vertical in just over 6 feet. The acrobatics are taking place approximately 8 to 12 feet above the foam pit. And when you factor in the 6 foot height of the foam pit itself, it's not uncommon for a rider to be performing a stunt 14 to 18, maybe even 20 feet above the ground. This is a high risk and high reward environment. I trust that this lead in that I've given you has provided you enough information uh, to sort of create a picture and appreciate what my boys are doing. So after making progress on tail whips, 360s, and a few other stunts, my boys were starting working on the backflip. This is also the point where they started running into problems, and after about an hour of failed attempts, they started looking for answers. I'd been observing and recording their attempts, and after reviewing um, the work that they'd done, their videos, we all agreed they weren't getting enough rotation. All my coaching and instruction wasn't working. We all what knew what needed to happen, it just wasn't coming together. Now this is where the power of the learning environment really kicked in, also peer-based instruction. While my younger son was uh, uh, at the top of a drop, uh, at, the, at the top of the ramp, I noticed that he was engaged in a discussion with an older writer, a young man in his early, uh, or uh, late, to early, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, they were having a discussion, um, and I could see from off on afar that the older writer was providing Caleb instruction on his rotation. I could see Caleb imitating the actions of the older writer as he sort of demonstrated what he needed to do. My older son, Levi, was just off on the side of the ramp listening to the conversation. In a few short minutes, Caleb dropped in, got the full rotation that he needed to do the backflip. Levi followed along and was also successful. All the riders hooted and hollered and, and acknowledged my boy's successful stunts. This is the power of a significant learning environment. I have been arguing since the mid-90s that uh, the learning is dependent upon the creation of significant learning environments and the immersion of the learner in those environments. A learning environment can be the Whistler Aerodome or foam pit. 
a classroom, your classroom, my classroom, an online course, or anywhere for that matter where learning can take place. I've also argued that learning is a responsibility to the learner and that the teachers are not able to make a student learn anything. The best that teachers can do is develop or establish that environment and immerse the student in that environment and then motivate and inspire the learner to take ownership of their own learning. When learning takes place, a teacher is really just a facilitator who helps the learner navigate the learning environment and the process itself. In this course, you will learn to identify, analyze, and utilize constructivist theories that will help you create and implement significant digital learning environments that will help you and your learners make meaningful connections and take ownership of learning.